Good tidings, all you beautiful people. Welcome in to another episode of League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you guys for a bit of a slobber knocker weekend recap to get through. And it all starts with a matchup that always lives up to the hype, even if Faker is not playing. Of course, we're talking T1 and D+. Even though this was a sweep, that doesn't do this series justice. No, it doesn't tell the full story because you are absolutely spot on. D plus Kia plus T1, you are going to get some thrilling League of Legends. If not, you know, maybe the most clean, most mechanically uh, proper League of Legends. That's not what you're here for. You're here to see the blood. You're here to see the fights. You're here to see those nexuses go down. D plus T T1, even if it was that sweep that we didn't get the full type of series, you had those pushbacks. You had those extended team fights where you started to believe that it was possible for T1 to make this a three-game affair. Unfortunately, not the case. And those extended team fights are exactly where you see the mechanical prowess of this T1 roster that we saw so many times during their incredibly dominant runs. Even without Faker, you saw shades of it. You had Poby get some great engages, but unfortunately, getting caught out ends up costing T1 the first game. I feel so bad for him because that's all people are going to remember and talk about. It's all people are going to remember and want to talk about in this game, even though, of course, as you mentioned, beforehand, some pretty good engages were important and key parts of these fights, these fights for T1 that they were able to get anything out of, stay in the game. That was a big part of it. So it is on one of those really stinging sides when you are the one that does eventually get caught out. And I think that this was just simply one of those situations of, of experience out on stage at the time in that type of pressure cooker situation. That's where I think that type of decision making slipped up a little bit. And that's where, of course, a great squad like D plus Kia capitalizes. And that's the type of form that we have seen them round into in the last couple of weeks, warming up, boiling up just a little bit into that territory where you could start to feel confident about what they are shaping into. And, you know, no doubt about it, D-plus played pretty solid in these two games. I mean, the second game took them a long time to close out. They needed pretty much every objective on the map multiple times because of some heroic 10K base defenses out of T1, which, again, you want to look for a positive at the end of a 0-2. There's always fight and never any quit in this T1 roster, and Game 2 was full case in point to that. It's a good sign to see this from T1, especially in comparison to some of the other matches that we have seen since Faker's absence, to see, you know, these glimpses, these little pieces that you can understand, put together, and, and believe in this T1 roster is one of these good things to stem the bleeding, because there's no mistaking that you're still bleeding. You're still losing out with someone like Faker, not in this lineup, of course, mechanically, and then even more so what he's communicating, what that brain is taking in from the enemy team and analyzing for what is next for T1. That is the biggest misstep and the biggest thing that, of course, Poby just can't replace, can't just be that. And the expectation should not be that from the T1 fans. I think everyone's been calm and collected so far. Good game, good series against D plus Kia, even with that loss result still feeling somewhat comfortable but but you are looking over your shoulder if you are t1 in the lck standings well again you're looking at them hanging out in that four or five spot especially if d plus is in this type of form but either way both those squads are reaching up to a team like kt rolster who Trap game against drx so many times you talk about kt all of a sudden having a terrible series getting destroyed they got behind in some of these games, but man, the team fighting out of this squad was on full display, winning constant team fights that they had absolutely no business winning. It wasn't pretty, but they win yet another series, 11 and one now. Against, against what everyone thought it was gonna be, the superstition of the DRX upset coming through against KT Ulster, it doesn't come to fruition. We don't have it because instead we are talking about aiming and lands. We're talking about yeah boy, BDD in the mid lane. We're talking about cuz this is the team. And of course you can't be forgetting about the king in the top side, Mr. Keen up there for KT Rolster. This is a great series where yes, some mistakes, some good stuff actually coming across from DRX to counteract as part of this, but it really is again, another example and another vote of confidence into KT Rolster that they are of this elite tier in the LCK. And 
you know, we'll talk about uh, the top of the LPL table a little bit later in the show, but the dominance of the top two in both the LCK and the LPL, something we haven't seen, I don't know if ever, with the 12 and 0 Gen G and now this 11 and 1 KT looking like they are just leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of the LCK. I think there's two ways to kind of take this. There's one where you're going, okay, you know, this is boring. I don't like it. These two teams, they're just so much better than the other two. This is, it has to be them at the end of the day, what it's going to boil down to type of situation. I'm going to remind you that there is a silver lining to that, where there have been years where we don't have two teams competing at that ultra elite tier. We have someone just running away, away with the whole show and you can't catch up. This is a better situation, I think, in both regions. There's still a lot more to discuss or to look into it and why this has played out this year. But I think from a fan perspective, what you're going to get to see at the top of the table in the LCK and the top of the table in the LPL this year is that competition, is that rivalry between these ultra elite squads. Because there's so many other world-class teams, just what KT wants, they've been riding under the radar a little bit with how dominant they've looked. And that's exactly where you want to be if you're a fan of the KT Rolster Coaster as we're heading towards that final playoff push over in the LCK had the beginning of I guess what you call playoffs in the LEC we've got the summer playoffs and then the summer regional final whatever it is lots of games left but things getting kick off with a pair of upsets in this group stage as we hit best of threes and we start with Fnatic who were the second seed from the regular season looked so dominant SK shows up on the day, give them a lot of pressure, and get back-to-back -back Barons at 20 minutes, and control around Baron was the story of both these games. And it's so unfortunate, but it really is one of those critical things that you cannot be messing up on that second occasion, looking at those things that play into getting those Barons early for SK. That is really where you see things just fall apart for Fnatic. They're not prepared at that moment to deal with that push, the pressure that is gonna be created from that advantage. And it just absolutely floored them and stomped them in all those situations. And I think you can look at a bunch of individual members, of course, of Fnatic for where these mistakes come in, leading to this ability to challenge, to take that Baron at that early point in these matches. It really also felt like once SK really came out swinging and punched them in the jaw in that first game, Fnatic seemed kind of shell-shocked because all of a sudden in game two, all these mechanical misplays that we didn't see throughout all of the regular season, Humanoids whiffing on Azir ultis, Razorks flashing into walls, Noah and Trimby had almost no impact, were never able to get rolling in either of these games. And it, it's a tough evaluation for Fnatic, but one of the things, of course, you know, comparables and things that you're trying to do here when you're in a fight, if you're boxing or something like that, it's all about can you take that punch from your opponent and what is your reaction? What is your response after taking that hit? Fnatic, their response was panic disorganization was what came through. And that's really unfortunate because you had to look within. You had to see all the good that you did this split and try to have that faith, try to bounce back into that trust. I don't think they were able to access any of those positive things that they were able to do throughout this split to build them up into this position where now, unfortunately, they've fallen from. Hopefully, you know, the mental can bounce back in that loser's bracket because we were ready to talk about a potential world's run with how good they looked in the regular season. Be sad for them to fall off this quickly. The other matchup that I guess is an upset because Mad Lions are the defending champs, but I think heading into playoffs, XL looked better. Most people would have said that, but not in the 2-0 fashion that they showed over Mad, I think people would be expecting. I don't think so, but I guess this is the Mad Lions secret strategy, right? Run it down. I need the loser's that, buff, you know? You gotta get into that loser's bracket to feel that mojo just right. I don't know if this is the performance that you needed to, to fully get through down into that lower bracket, but there's room to talk about that one. This is just how it goes. The LEC, we are in, as you mentioned, these group stage type of best of three playoff type of zone. This is one of those things where you, you maybe take it as, hey, we're in full playoffs. You got this time. We're going to have a full series to say it out. Man, it can happen just like that. Those mistakes that take you out in this group stage. 
And again, credit to Excel. They played really solid, especially Limit had some fantastic uh, playmaking and engages. Patrick looks more like the ADC of old. And Oda Wamne on the Rumble is downright nasty. That is the one that I think is finally paying off for this XL squad. We have ripped on this one for so many times, waiting for that impact that Odawamne would have for this team to take over, really lead the charge. I think this is some of the signs of it for this team to be able to get that type of dependent, uh, you know, performance and reliability from him in that top side. Big difference for me in this series. G2, Koi rivalry we've seen so many different matchups in playoffs going back to when they were rogue of course and this is the one that probably went as expected an eight and one g2 squad coming away with the 2-0 there were some close moments and in classic g2 fashion maybe having a bit too much fun on the rift some of them this sequence in game two in the top lane where caps is flashing into auto nothing oh then Malrang kills himself to a turret at 100 health i i G2 possessed the Koi brains on that play. That's the only explanation. It was a sequence of unthinkable results that just lead it into that stun lock of, what is this guy doing? What's happening? I'm dead to turn. Oh my goodness. It was an absolute fiesta at that point. Yes, I think a little bit, a little bit too far. Maybe a 12 instead of 11 on the dial of fun for three caps and the rest of G2, but they get the job done. Still feeling you know, relatively safe in our understanding and our expectation for this G2 lineup, where they're able to succeed, what is going right for them. Of course, the individual play of Caps that we just looked at and, you know, mental play maybe as well for what's going on. But you're talking about Yike in the jungle. You're looking at BB in that top side. This is the good stuff from this G2 lineup. And I think it doesn't really take too much away from Koi. This is that expected result given the power that G2 had carrying into this series. Slot the Han Sama Kalista right beside Draven in terms of pocket pick, ban this away from this dude. A pick that's not super meta right now, but he dominates on back to back games. The synergy with him and Mickey with uh, those Kalista ultis was absolutely fantastic. And uh, Yike, we've seen this jungle rel now across all the major regions, and she is becoming a menace. I love it. I love this jungle rel that is coming on in. I get it. Maybe not as super exciting as a shift as you would want to see type of thing but i'm taking it i'm accepting it and i like seeing champions different places across the rift rel is one of those ones being utilized in this position that tankiness that engage that stun this is the good stuff that you love to see from her and i think the creativity that some of these junglers are able to come up with yike included into that one with the pathing with the way that you're making these fights happen because of what rel provides that has been a fun wrinkle to check out in these new games Last series from the LEC, the only one that went three games, Heretics versus BDS. Things look great for Heretics. Game one, you know, look calm, cool, collected. Viteo's playing well. Flackett's playing well. We get a Seraphine in game two. But Mark, Evie, 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 Evie on Cassante and Orn. It's some of these mechanical mistakes he's making. Honestly, we love the guy. He's so nice. But these are unforgivable in a pro game. We were fans uh, bringing Evie over into the scene, hoping that it was going to be the positive side, the angle, the crazy Evie, the double thumbs up. Well, I'm here to tell you guys, it's a nightmare. The double thumbs down right now oh, for Evie tragedy, and Heretic. No. You can't be doing that. You can't be having this many individual and especially those individual mechanical mistakes that we see come across through these champions that you wouldn't think that they would happen and then even something like the Cassante, where i get it can happen to certain degrees you can't be missing them the way that avi was in these crucial moments and even more so you can't be doing that when the rest of your team is finding good ways to play and positive aspects where you are that aspect you are that angle that the enemy team is clinging on to holding on into this game until they can crack it right open and step on in for the w Especially, you see Viteo in this series. He's playing like a mid laner that you want to see compete internationally. That's how good he's been since he rejoined Heretics. And honestly, at this point, I feel like Ibo should get promoted for their last series in Loser because even throwing in an academy guy with no synergy or chemistry with the team, I feel like Evie's probably not contributing a lot when it comes to communicating and He's going to be an upgrade, even with no team synergy. 
I think at this point, and especially this one, this is kind of, at least for me, kind of the fa final nail in the coffin on this Evie experiment on what we're trying to do for Heretics. And it's one of those ones where you look at this Heretics roster and the organization, they've shown us that they're willing to make change. They will make the necessary movements if it's possible, if there's an upgrade, if there's a move. We've added Viteo, we've changed out Jack Spectre, we've brought in Flackett, all these things happen. You've seen positive effects. You've seen that make it work out. You can't be sandbagging it and dragging back this squad with what Evie is doing in the top side. It needs to turn around. Fun side of things, BDS, the ones who actually won the series, looked pretty good in their two wins. We're seeing Crowny play Vayne, even though that was a loss. We know they love to put all the <laughs> eggs in the Crowny basket. Nuke has a great Jace performance. This is... This is more akin to that 12-0 playoff run BDS that we saw in spring. It's not there yet, but step in the right direction. I think you can, you know, take your positives that Adam, he's Adam. He's the same thing that we're we got seeing. Darius. Same, type, yeah, yeah. same type of aggressive play in that top side. But I want to add in the positive here for BDS on top of the things that you talked about. I think that Shao is having a good uh, part of this time right now, good recent stretch and run and what has been going on in the LEC. And I think we saw that extended into this group stage playoff. And hopefully it extends to a continued run for them as BDS goes to winners, Heretics obviously goes down to lunar losers, still not eliminated yet out of this group stage. LPL regular season wrapped up, and we got to highlight the elephant in the room that's not really an elephant at all. In their finale against World Elite, had no business 2 0 them, but that's just BLG things such as finishing 15 and 1. The first time an LPL team has ever finished with a record that good, and still, they're probably not the favorites going into playoffs unbelievable what we have in the lpl and i mean that in the sense of what we have with blg and then what we have with a squad like jdg that doesn't have the record to match up but yet still has shown us that quality that power that ability to take over and crush the opponent that's what you want to see in the lpl and you better believe blg just because we're not putting out the same level of jdg even with this historic run historic season in the LPL, they are the two titans that you are watching out for out east. I, I don't know if I've ever seen such a wall of an opponent. This